John McIntyre, lovely to see you. Um, kudos to everyone who's come out on what is a cold, wet night in London. And those <coughs> who said, no, I've, I'm ignoring the email that suggests maybe I'm going to zoom it. I'm going to take my chances with the power failures and I'm going to be here anyway. I'm proud of all of you. Well done. Shown grit being here. Well, of course, we will come on to grit later on. And those of you at home, you've bravely joined on Zoom, not knowing whether we were going to be here, not knowing whether you'd be dialing into a darkened room and us all kind of here with candles or stuff. So I'm glad you're <coughs> here. I've been here for about 40 minutes now and touch with the power's been stable. So we shall, we shall see how we go. We shall see how we go. Right. Okay. This is what I am talking about. It is rather a long title, isn't it? Embracing your adaptive career. And think about redefining success in project well, in our project management careers, right? Uh, this is kind of what we're talking about. There's four bullet points on there. I'm not going to read through them for you because there's nothing worse than going to a presentation and finding someone who stands there and looks at the slides and reads them verbosely at you. Because quite frankly, you could order that yourself. You're, I'm sure, perfectly capable and avid readers. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm, not sure. A few, a, few, a, few, a few yes, a few not so sure about that one. Okay, now this talk, um, this came about sort of earlier this year and it's, it's kind of evolved over having sort of thought about it a few times. But it actually started off with my son. He's in year seven now at school, which is for those of us who are a little bit older, that's kind of first year of secondary school in, in old money. Um, but I'm sitting down helping him with his homework. And his homework, it, it was geography homework. And we were talking about rivers and, and the paths they flow. And do you remember this kind of, um, do you remember doing rivers at school, anybody? Yep. Online, people done that. I mean, do you remember doing rivers? Oxbow lakes, meanders and things? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely, yes. So it was like, oh, you put me on, put me on, put me on the spot, Paddock, find the meat button. Sorry, sorry about that. I won't do that to you too often, I, I promise. <laughs> um, yeah, Oxbow Lakes and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sitting there going through it with him. And I'm one of those people that tends to make really bizarre links in my mind. I connect things together left, right and centre. It's probably a good skill for a project manager now to think about it. But um, I was sort of looking at this and thought, well, actually, because I'd just been reading a, a career book called The Squiggly Career. Um, and I thought, well, actually, I quite like the way this idea of sort of meandering rivers feels a lot like how careers sometimes go. So I'm sort of making that little link in my head. And that's kind of how this court, this has kind of evolved. Um, because as I was speaking to my son about this stuff, I try and link what he's learning at school to real world things. So we tend to go on a trip to a museum or those kind of things. But that evening I was looking at the BBC website and the BBC website had this article on it, which was very timely as it turned out. It was talking about re-wiggling Swindale Beck. Now, Swindale Beck is a fairly, fairly unadventure, un, un, unexciting river on a, on a, on a global scale. It's, it's kind of small and local. But what was interesting about this one was, a couple of hundred years ago, where this goes through a valley, you can kind of see it there, right? where it goes through this valley, people had the bright idea that actually, if we straighten this river out a bit, it would be a lot better for our farming because we've suddenly got our fields that are sort of not jagged at the ends. I can get my tractor around there easily and things like that. So actually, let's smooth this out a bit, smooth the flow of this river, and then we'll be far more effective at our farming. And that kind of makes sense, right? You can imagine they probably got a project manager at the time who got onto that task, got a few people organized and dug it and adjusted it and made that happen and celebrated their success. Except, well, it probably was successful at the time, but we look at the world through a different lens now. And what's happened with this story here, what they said is basically what they found was diversity suffered as a result. If you take all those meanders out of a river, what happens to the river? What happens to the water? Faster. Absolutely, it goes faster. If the river's going faster, there aren't those kind of beds on the inside of the bend where salmon like to stop and spawn. There aren't places for the plants to grow. The water's just whooshing along at a rate of knots. Also means potentially more floods downstream and all those kind of challenges that come with it. And eventually said enough's enough. Environment Agency and various others got involved and said actually let's re-wiggle this river. Now I'm sure they did have more technical terms but that's how the BBC referred to it and quite frankly I liked it. <laughs> so they did this project to add some wiggles back into the river. And the amazing thing about this was they predicted that after they do that, they would expect to see diversity improve. That was their hypothesis. What they weren't quite prepared for was how quickly diversity changed in that river. 
Within three months of the diggers leaving site, they were seeing noticeable differences in the diversity of life in the river. Um, they had salmon starting to spawn again. They had plant life growing again that hadn't been there for years. And it was an amazing, noticeable change in a really, really, really short period of time. All through re-wiggling our river. I'm doing the thing with my kid from school. I'm reading this book about careers. I'm thinking about my own career. And all these kind of things kind of knit together in your mind, don't they? Who likes PowerPoint? Anyone here good at PowerPoint? Do we love a good PowerPoint animation? Mm. Everyone loves a good PowerPoint animation, right? You're going to be blown away by this, right? Are you ready? Are you ready? So, uh, actually, let's just skip that one because we'll go straight to the animation, right? Here we go. Ready? Wait for this. <laughs> Look at that, right? Me, I, I drew that. I drew that with a, with a mouse clicking it around. That was... Sorry, he wasn't looking. Hang on a minute. I'm going to do that for you again. So sorry, I thought. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at you. Okay. So good you've seen it twice now. There we go. So, <laughs> so the reason I did this is because I wanted to kind of draw this idea, this idea of a career path out for us. Because we tend to think about things quite in, in quite a linear mode when we think about careers. So project management career, we start off with our education. Education is very, very important. We tell our kids this a lot. I tell my seven-year-old this an awful lot. Education is very, very important to stick with it. Then maybe if we're going on our project management path, we might start off in some kind of a team. If we're um, IT teams, we might start off in a software team before we end up being so good at software and being amazing at development and coding and things like that. They say, you're great at that. Stop doing that. Be a project manager instead, which has never quite made sense to me, but that's kind of what we do to people. So we'll accept it, right? So they then may become a sort of junior project manager and find they enjoy this whole project management stuff. Then become a project manager. Maybe you're going to be a program manager. Maybe you'd be a major project manager. Maybe you're not being a project director, but you're kind of on this trajectory on your project management path. And that's kind of how we tend to draw out a project management career. Or a PMO person like myself, we sort of say, well, you come in as a PMO administrator, then an analyst, then maybe you're a PMO manager or PMO director or head of PMO. We've got that quite linear view of the world. And yet, that's probably not the path that a lot of us do. Now, if we go right back to those kind of those moments of um, being at being being at nursery, and the kids sitting around in a circle, and they're thinking about uh, what do you want to be when you grow up, what sort of answers do we get? Let's ask some people in the room, and I'll come to you guys online a bit. What sort of things typically come up at that point? Doctor. Doctor. Singer. Singer or singer? God, I could have been an amazing singer. Well, so yeah, what else we got? Train driver. Still am after enough drinks. Train driver. Yeah, my, my son is very, very passionate about the trains. Yep, absolutely. Firefighter. I heard somebody actually, sort of, I heard sort of, I heard on a video actually saying they wanted to be a, a fire truck. <laughs> I want to be a fire truck. You mean a firefighter? No, no, fire trucks. Oh, okay, well, there we go. Go for it. If that's what you want, if that's what you want to be, I'm not going to stand in your way. Not least because they're big and heavy, and it would hurt. Um, but nobody sets out in their career at that young age to become a project manager, and far less start off at that age to become a PMO person. And, and it's interesting. And yet here we all are. Here we all are. Here you are online. Here we all are on this kind of career. So in a way, we're already on this squiggly career path, right? And um, this is what things kind of look like nowadays i think for the sort of generation coming up and through right now i've changed the word there slightly you'll note it says formal education rather than education on this side and that's because we never really stop learning this idea of learning and then going through our career sort of doesn't really happen anymore we're always learning people are fond volunteering taking time out to do that sort of volunteering step maybe not at the beginning of the career but sort of during it doing more things helping out experimenting doing different things there People are traveling, traveling. I always wanted to do a year out. It never really worked for me, but I, I'm very, very jealous of people that take that time out to go and explore the world. Um, side hustles. Has anyone here got a side hustle? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, a, few, a few side hustles. Do your company know about your side hustle? <laughs> we're, we're, we're not talking, we're not, we're, we're not, we won't dive into detail on that one. But yeah, it's, it's interesting where we have this sort of connected world now and, and the whole sort of world on your, on your fingertips and your computer, that people are experimenting with little side hustles, fun things they can do to make money on the side. Can I, can I set up a small little eBay store telling, um, selling, selling things that I'm interested in? 
can I also even actually use this as a stepping stone to starting my own business up? I can try it really cheaply on the side. And if it looks like it's got legs, maybe I'm going to expand that out and make that bigger afterwards. So we've got this sort of experimentation that never, never really used to happen. So we didn't have that opportunity. Redundancy. Anyone been made redundant? Anyone online in one of the room? There's some nods. There's some nods. So back in my parents' day, redundancy was a terrible thing because you did have this linear career. You'd come out of school, school, you'd learn a trade, and then you'd kind of stick with that forever until you retired. And you get quite a nice, quite a nice company pension. I don't see those anymore either. Um, nowadays, <laughs> sadly, um, but but that's not that's not the case anymore. Redundancy is far more common and is not doesn't have the stigma attached to it as much anymore. I've been made redundant twice in my career, both both quite closely together. Funnily enough, um, one was I was working for an IT outsourcing company. They hadn't won many big deals for a couple of years. They cut the team down. Um, there were four roles at my level and they were bringing it down to two. And we were having a due to have our first child in three, three months. Yes, yeah, we were three months away from our first child, which is a bit of a scary time to be being made redundant. Um, I wasn't quite sure I was going for the, going to be cold. It was kind of 50 50. Right. I looked at the looked at their criteria and I still wasn't quite sure. But I sort of grabbed it and said, you know, what? actually, let me volunteer now because I took the view that with three months, I've got no idea what post what life with baby is going to look like. But I know where we are now. Let me take redundancy now find a new role and then I'm sort of well set up and I'm taking control and owning that situation. That was redundancy number one. Redundancy number two was only about two years after that um, because so I, le I left that one. Now if you are just about to embark on a scary fam new family life thing with no idea what that's going to entail, what sort of job are you going to look for? Are you going for a high-risk startup? Probably not. You're going for something stable, right? So I went for Network Rail. They're backed by government. It feels pretty stable, doesn't it? They've got lots of unions. That feels pretty safe. Nice and secure. Let's go for that. Go for a permit job rather than a contractor job. Safe, 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 safe. So I went through several rounds of very, very diligent interviews for that one. I'm happy to say that I got through all of them. Well done, me. Yay. Um, and I got into the role. I was in the role for days when there was I was invited to a meeting where they were discussing the upcoming move from their London offices to Milton Keynes uh, sorry what now because I don't recall this ever being mentioned during all of this process and it very very clearly says in my contract that I work out of your office at Euston Oh, yeah. Well, but didn't we tell you? So, no. Um, and it turned out they had a lovely new office they were building in Milton Keynes, which is there. And it's lovely. It's quite near the station that they were all moving to. So that was their plan. A year and a half time, they were moving to Milton Keynes. So I looked at that and I spoke to my wife and I said, do you want to move to Milton Keynes? She went, nope. She said, do you want to move to Milton Keynes? I said, nope. And that was that. So we stayed with that until they were moving. And we said, thank you very much. We're not coming and took redundancy from them as well. So those were my two redundancies, um, both for very, very different reasons. But that was my adventure. And each one of those caused me to pivot. One was going into something stable because I really, really desperately needed stability at that point in my life. Um, the other one, because I knew I was leaving, it allowed me plenty of time to look for a role that really, really excited and inspired me, which is what I moved on to next. So I ended up with a very, very agile focused um, PMO team, uh, um, as you know, uh, uh, Ticketmaster after that one. Um, so we've got this kind of far more wiggly, bouncy around sort of thing that we do now. So yeah, side hustles, redundancies in there. There's, um, yeah, time out with family. People do take time. I, I've taken a few moments where I've sort of been involved in contracts and I've chosen to dial back for critical periods with my kids. Um, both of my children are um, have autism, um, one with ADHD, both with very, very, well, one with very, very complex needs. Um, so sometimes being able to take time out for that is the right thing for me to do as well. So we've got all these things going on. And sometimes we try new things. Sometimes we want those adventures. Sometimes that side has actually become something we want to embark on and see if it works for us. And we might go off on this little journey off onto the side and it might work or it might not. We might loop back in again a little bit lower down and come back again. And we might go around that a couple of times. And this is what our careers kind of look like now. They're these weird, wonderful adventures. And does that mean that we're not successful in our career if we're sort of bouncing around that side hustle loop for a long time. Or are we just redefining what that sort of success looks like? 
for us. Come back to that thought in a little bit. This was the other one, AI. Now, it feels almost compulsory nowadays. So you can't stand up and do a presentation without having a slide that goes, ooh, AI, that's all a bit scary, isn't it? So here's mine. Ooh, AI, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Uh, what do we think of AI? Project managers, project management people. For, against, scary? Dangerous. Dangerous, dangerous. Um, yes, because we, uh, we, we sort of have this vision of, yes, Terminator and those kind of things taking over the world. But actually, when we're suddenly realizing now that the, the, the bots that we're seeing now are far different to that, but actually, they can make decisions really, really scarily quickly. And we start thinking about how they could make those decisions in very, very bad ways and well-meaning ways. And we think about how clever we are as project managers who actually probably run the projects that build these things. And that makes us even more scary about what they might do, right? So yes, AI, um, it's got there. It could replace the equivalent of 300 million jobs. So I seem to be browsing the BBC website quite a lot for news articles uh, at the moment, apparently. But yes, so possibly scary. Um, Possibly dangerous. Um, has anybody found AI things helpful for their job, helpful in their role recently? Has anyone played with that? Yes, sir. You, would you be able to share? I'll yeah, share absolutely. Uh, with my company, I use AI every day in order to build up. Also, inside project management, I use AI in order to uh, have a you know passage of states or uh, recognize what we are not able to recognize. For example, business intelligence. Yes. I use AI and also for companies. So, so using it a lot to help. So then that kind of Absolutely. that sort of co-pilot model, where it's helping you with Absolutely. coding and all those Absolutely. kind of things. Yeah. In ML side, but also using uh, ChatGPT in order to create uh, you know question and response to help companies to to build some kind of content. It's it's a quite powerful. Obviously, can be scary from one side. But from the other side is uh, absolutely an accelerator. It depends how it goes to be used, you know. And the, the, the possible are infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I love it. Um, can you can just check? Can you hear the sound from the room? Okay, on online. This is right. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's fine. How are we doing with AI on the phone? Have you played around with it? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I have I have been responsible for automating processes, call center processes using AI. Yes. Um, sorry, I just realized that you can, the people in the room can't see your faces. Um, I can. So you can hey, take my word for it. They all, uh, I mean, it looks fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone online looks amazing. Uh, they Thank can't you. see you in the room, but I will relay anything. So if you pull faces, I will relay that to the room for you. If you want to use hand gestures, I will endeavor yeah. to mime so everyone <laughs> knows what's going on. I'll do, I'll do my best. But yeah, the thing is, we don't quite know. Somewhere, somewhere, in this room, on, on one side of the room, we've got AI is going to be amazing and really, really helpful and great for productivity. On the other side, the whole world is going to end, okay? And the truth may lie somewhere in a weird meander down the middle of the room there. We don't quite know. And we can't predict which way it's going to go. And it probably won't be in ways we're thinking about now. Hmm. What we do need to do, therefore, it's even more important than ever that we try and steer away from this linear career path and look at how we can be adaptive, how we can move with the flow, how we can pivot, how we can suddenly grab a side hustle, take a different route and change things as and when technology is pushing us in those directions, just as much as as and when we decide we want to do something different. So this is kind of what we're thinking about when I'm talking about this, this adaptive career. It's quite a powerful thing for us because it allows us that sort of resilience that we need in our lives. Resilience, if AI does take over my job tomorrow, that I can do something slightly different. Instead, I can pivot around that because I've got that resilience. Um, if something happens in my family life that I need to focus on, I am prepared to make those changes to make that work and then look at how I get back into career. Or maybe I take a role on that allows me more time at home and sort of change those things around in that way. And um, whatever it might be, I'm doing stuff that makes allows me to adapt more and allows me to be more resilient. But that's all about me, 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 me. It's also good for people in organizations and the organizations that we work for. So who here is a manager of people? Um, anybody else? Sort of line manager or been a line manager? 
Saw somebody line, managed somebody once. There we go. A few, a, a few hands going up there. So, yeah, I mean, this is also really, really useful for organisations. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, it's hard, right? Because it used to be quite easy to hire somebody back in the day. We look for a project manager. We get a few CVs through. We do a quick sift, see if we like the name. We make sure they had a Prince 2 certification. And have they got a few years in project management with a company to recognise? Fantastic. That's the person for us. And it was nice and easy. It's got a lot more challenging now because people have got these diverse careers and different backgrounds that we actually need to do a little bit more work on that. But also, it's fantastic because as countless studies have shown, the more diverse our workplace is, diverse in terms of ideas, richness, backgrounds, the widest possible definition of diverse that we could think of, the more of that there is, the more productive and innovative that workplace is. So if we're bringing people in that have these different backgrounds, your company will be the better for it. And the relationships your employees build amongst themselves will be better for it. And that in turn increases productivity. Now, how does this bringing people in from different backgrounds increase productivity? I think there's two things there. Firstly, we've got these studies that show actually diverse groups tend to be productive. But the other thing is, if you're bringing people, if people are on this linear path and they're stuck with this very, very narrow view of what a career looks like and they're going through the motions, I need to get promoted because that's the next stage and that's how I earn more money and that's what I need to do to be successful. If our definitions of success have changed and we're factoring family life, all of these kind of things we want to do as well, we're far more likely to find that the people applying for jobs are applying for those jobs, not because they're going through the motions, not because they have to go for that stepping stone, but it's because it's something that they're genuinely interested in. And if someone's genuinely interested in a job, they are going to do better at it because they're passionate and driven and really genuinely want to be there. And that's, I guess, the other thing. So tying that together, it allows those better matches between roles and individuals. If we're more flexible as organizations and open to ideas when we're hiring people and people are coming into those roles with a different background, we can end up with really diverse, interesting teams that also really want to be doing the jobs that they're doing. And that's when magic happens for us. Um, who's got awkward gaps on their CV? We've got an awkward bit. We've got an awkward bit there. There's a couple, a couple of hands, a couple of hands in the room. Um, yeah. So life happens, right? Stuff happens, for, and we end up with those career gaps on our CV, or maybe we end up with a couple of roles in short succession. So it looks like we job hunt a bit. My advice for you in those situations is stop thinking about those things as negative. Too often, I think it certainly was a big thing in the past. Like, well, how can I can I hide that on my CV, um, and can I sort of play that one down? Oh, yeah, I did a bit of travelling, and we don't mm -hmm. tend to talk about it anymore as if we can avoid it. I think now with this push towards actually more more diverse um, diverse people in roles and taking more interest in who the person is rather than just do they tick the right boxes on a on a on a um, on a Prince Two certification list, it's more important than ever to actually tell the stories around those. Every time you are in an interview and somebody asks you a question, it is an opportunity to sell yourself. Every single one. What's this year where you weren't working in your in your CV can go one of two ways. It can be, a, uh, um, yeah, I, I just took a bit of time out. Very, very closed answer or you can use that opportunity to tell, to tell a story. It could be a story where you really struggled and what you learned out of that. It could be that you had a lot of stuff going on with family and what you learned from that and how that has built up your resilience and that changes what you were going to bring to the role. But it adds that richness to your background. And if you can get that story well defined for yourself and clear on what that brings to you and how that makes you a better, stronger person today, then bring that to that interview and take those questions as opportunities because they are opportunities. Every single time someone asks you a question in those situations, it is an opportunity for you to sell yourself. Don't shy away from those moments. Those moments are the ones that define us. Anyone can drift along in a career. 
it's those moments where it breaks, where it goes off piece, where it goes somewhere we never thought it would go that make us interesting. Um, by the way, has anyone finished? Has anyone finished this one yet? Has anyone been working on working on the puzzle there? There's always a mix of people. Some people have just sort of thought it's there and haven't really given it a second thought at all. Other people who must solve it, must figure it out, must figure it out. God, can't move on until I figure it out. Got a mixture of people in the room. No one's quite telling me which one they've gone for. It's quite easy if you start at the end and work to the yeah. end. That's <laughs> cheating. That's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always, Thinking outside always, the box. Always one. Always one. Okay, right. Who's ready for a quiz? Bit of interaction. Are we ready for a quiz? Yes. Pop quiz. Pop yeah. quiz. Cool. We're going to literally pop quiz. Let's see if you can hear this. On. Hang on a second. Let's see if you can hear this. Right. So. Right. Um, before you continue, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, We've been interrupted. It's, it's interesting when presentations or lectures have been delivered like this. But well, most of the time, it doesn't work in an operational setting where it must be on board and has a fixed regulation or procedure. All these things, they can consider you for a while if you're at work. But most of the time, they just lay you off. So um, the inclusion, diversity, and the rest to me, it works, but most of it is most of the time is a kind of a lip service issue. Yeah, um, I'm assuming you all heard that online. I mean, look, and let, <laughs> let's not avoid it, right? You've got a white English man standing up talking to you about diversity. There's a certain irony there. And there's probably, this is a guy that's got no real idea what he's talking about on this one. I think that's probably quite fair to acknowledge and say. And it's all very well for me to say that we are, it, it, teams are more diverse nowadays and managers are hiring. And there are people quite rightly challenging in the room saying, actually, you don't really know what you're talking about. It might it might have got better, but it's still really, really hard out there. And if I am not a white male in the project management career, industry, it is still very hard. Yeah? And it is still hard to get through. I, I'm not denying that. Of course, you are absolutely right. And of course, you know that far more than I know that. I can tell stories, but you're living it. I absolutely don't deny that at all. I would like to believe it has got better. I work with far more diverse groups of project managers and teams now than I remember working with in the past. I still think we've got a long way to go. I still think some things are quite weird. If you look at how how computing started off, um, there were it, it suddenly got really weird that I'm sh the early days of computing, there were a lot of women in computing. And then suddenly in the 80s, 90s, it became really male. I don't quite get what happened there, and then it's started to get a bit more diverse again now. But I don't, there's those bits that I just don't understand, right? I think, I hope we're getting better. I think companies are genuinely starting to recognize that actually diversity is better. Is there still discrimination? Absolutely, yes. That I'm not denying that. Please don't think I'm denying that. I do think things have got better. I do think there's more of an opportunity and people are more keen to listen to those stories now when you get into an interview situation. I guess that's what I was saying. I will talk a little bit more in a second about some of the things that you can do on this career path to help yourselves as well. But please don't take me as saying no, no, magically no, no. Do, everything is fixed. I do appreciate your honest... I'm certainly not saying everything no, is I do fixed. appreciate your honest response. Thank you, sir. Oh, hey, Dan. May I add to this and say yeah, please. not really discriminate nation is more about stereotyping it's like uh, project management has got a lot of soft skills so it's like how you manage people you inspire them a stakeholder a decision making and that's why I will use you as a white male since you are very yeah. open at this like this I'm, I'm good at this yeah I, I, I don't need someone uh, uh, else to do this. I may need Ashraf. He looks like oh, physics. He can do quantitative thing, which I cannot do. You know, yeah. so it's more about stereotyping, I think, than 
and discrimination or yeah. I, 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 I think I think that's I think that's a good point and and, and it's interesting and this is where sort of I think you go through I don't know <coughs> levels of things you get that you get very very blatant racism sexism at a very overt level and then kind of down level we've got that sort of stereotyping um, that happens and then we also get this kind of I would like to build a very very diverse team but actually I've got this real crisis project going right now and I suddenly really just want to get someone that I, I don't want to take a risk so actually I'm going to end up with sort of going for what I know as, as kind of stereotyping funneling but when, but whether we're saying person being racist whether we're saying it's or or, or di diverse to <laughs> um, or whether we're saying actually it is institutional which is more what the stereotyping kind of thing is it does exist and it is a challenge for people today and it remains so but we will talk about a few things about how you help yourself on a squiggly career um this adaptive career as we go through this talk as well and hopefully some of those things do help with that as well have i covered that one okay yeah. Thank you so much. Right, let's challenge you some music, music, music. Pop quiz, literally pop quiz. Right, who can tell me who this is? If this works. If Bluetooth hasn't turned off while I was talking. Who recognizes this? Anybody? I've got a nod. A few recognize the song. Helen Dream on the night. Oh, oh, we're. we're Fast <laughs> fingers on the chat. D Ream. Anyone remember D Ream? D Ream? No. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Who's this then? Do we know if we're, I've got a D Ream fan online? Who's this one? Brian Cox. It's Brian Scott. Then, yeah. It's Brian Cox. Absolutely not that. Not that Brian Cox. The other Brian Cox. Just so we're just so we're clear on that one. We've got the right Brian. The right Brian Cox. That's important. Not to confuse our Brian Coxes. But yeah, absolutely. This is this is Brian. This is Brian Cox here. So I've just I just clicked on something. I've lost the whole of my screen. People there. I think we're back with people on screen now. There we go. I lost my people online for a minute there. That was a bit scary. But they are back now. Yeah. This is this is Brian Cox. And I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of what this kind of adaptive career looks like for some sort of real people to bring it to life a bit. So yeah. This is this is Brian Cox, younger and 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 the and the current version. So people. That's one as well, is it? That's him. Yeah. Same guy. Same guy. Yeah. <laughs> He was younger and prettier in those days. Not Cliff Richard. <laughs> um, <laughs> not Cliff Richard, not indeed. So yeah, so we know him now as a, as a sort of theoretical physicist. Um, he presents on TV. He takes a lot of very very complex physics and makes it friendly for people on television and things like that. And and, and my kids love him and all that kind of good stuff. Um, he is also someone. How do you think he did at school? A level maths. What do you think he got? He did do it. <laughs> Uh, he got a D, so yeah, he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't fail, but he certainly didn't pass uh, on that one. He was in a band at the time. The band was called. No, the band was called Dare. He was doing. He really was passionate about Dare, but the reality was Dare wasn't really working out. It was quite mainstream. It wasn't working. There was this dance group called D Ream. They needed a keyboard player. He's like, oh, I'll give that a go for you. And D Ream took off, and he ended up the keyboardist in D Ream for quite a while. So he did that. Um, he did do a sort of physics degree alongside it. Um, but that was kind of alongside <coughs> D. Ream, but he just kept that going in the background. And then when D. Ream disbanded, he pivoted from his career as a global pop dance icon in the background on a few videos um, to doing a doctorate in particle physics. And then he's obviously said, all right, well, actually, I've got the physics stuff. <coughs> I've been an entertainer. I'm very used to being on stage and, and, and performing. Let's combine those two things and suddenly you see him sort of combining those in the career that he has now. He's taken the best of those things and used those strengths to to model himself in the person he is now. But probably the most important part of his career adventure, <coughs> adventure he once was a voice actor on Postman Pat. There you go. Only one episode, but there we go. But you didn't know that. You'd be able to go home today knowing that you've learned something this evening. See, turn up to the AGM, you never know what you're going to find out. Uh, who's this one here? Easier one for you. Brian. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brian, Brian, Brian May, absolutely. Um, he was in a band called Smile. Then he was in a band called Queen. Oh, we got some knowledge. We got some knowledge in the room. Yeah, that's right, absolutely. 
The same, you're better. You're better that I didn't ask that one. Should have been ready to shout that <laughs> one out, wouldn't you? Um, another fit, <coughs> one, physicist. That wasn't quite deliberate, but actually, he also studied physics. Um, he second class degree, but he did get a degree in it. Um, and he uh, kind of left left the physics completely because Queen was fairly big, <laughs> so he focused on that for quite a while. Um, but after that, pivoted back into it again. Got a PhD in two thousand and six. Mm. Now and that's him there being all PhD'd up. Now, he went on to co-author a book called Bang, The Complete History of the Universe. Hmm. I don't know for sure, but I'm willing to bet that he's not short of a few quid. And he didn't need to write that book to make the money, right? So he probably co-authored that book because it was something he was passionate about, something that he wanted to do, and something that he felt would help communicate ideas to people. Make sense? Yeah? So there's another way someone has done different things and pivoted around. Right, enough of musicians who appear to be physicists. Let's get another one here. Uh, I don't have a soundtrack for Condoleezza Rice. But again, a fascinating, diverse, squiggly, adaptive career. Born in Alabama, while the South was still racially seg segregated. Reason from that, um, she was heavily involved in German reunification as a diplomat and ambassador for the US. Um, Big career after that, director of the Hoover Institute at Stanford University on the board of directors for, Drop, for Dropbox. And the middle one there, which I love, on the selection committee as a member for the college football playoffs in the US. And not because actually she was a big name and they wanted a big name on the board, but genuinely passionate about American football. And she was watching uh, interviews around the time. I don't know if she still uh, sort of continued to do this, but certainly around that time in interviews, she confessed that she was watching 14 to 15 matches per, per week on TV. So not just on there because it was an interesting role, but on there because she was really, really passionate about American football. So... It's an interesting question. What does success look like in an adaptive career? <laughs> if you ask these people now, if you ask um, Brian, Brian Cox, is it his time as a keyboardist, as a global pop icon? Or is it the fact that he's able to explain physics to people? But Brian May, is it the time that he spent, uh, that, is, is it his, his physics career? Or was it that one iconic moment where he stood playing the guitar on, on top of Buckingham Palace? What does success look like for him? Condoleezza Rice. Does she look back and say, actually, do you know what? My big success was the role I played brokering German reunification and the difference that I know I have made to how the world looks today. Or does she look at success and say, actually, I'm really successful because I've made enough money to be comfortable and I managed to get a role at a great moment in my life where I could combine something I was really, really passionate about with earning money and making a genuine difference and still finding time to sit at home and watch 14, get 14 to 15 games of football on TV every, every week. Success means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and those are not right. And those are not wrong. Every individual person here will have a different perception of what success is. And chances are, your idea of success now is not the same one as when you were sitting in nursery asking each other what career you wanted. And it probably won't be the same in 10 years' time. So there's another question from the back of the room. May I also add yes. to your nice explanation about success? I was reading a book called Inside Out by Charlie Unwin. Mm -hmm. And he played a big role in the progress of cycling, uh, mm -hmm. the cycling, and uh, he defines success as three, three different definitions. It's up to you which one you go for. Uh, KPIs, like this is the salary I got, whatever, mm -hmm. or uh, outcomes, you set certain goals, you achieve them or not, or mastery, which means that every day you're getting better at your craft or achieving your purpose and so on. Mm. And in his view, this is the real type of success that if you stick with it, you will out uh, success everyone else yeah. who actually follows uh, uh, outcomes or KPI. And it's, it's really that. beautiful. That's what was the book called again, sorry? Inside Out by yeah. uh, Charlie oh. Unwin. Cool. 
Now, uh, there is a danger with going to these kind of talks and these kind of events. They end up getting very, very expensive on Amazon afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> and you end up with a bigger and bigger pile in the back of the car. Just to, these things should come with a health warning on, 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 that, on that basis alone. But yes, so squiggly careers and different things, different things meaning success at different times and being willing to flex and adapt making your own definitions of success. And we are lucky people. We are all lucky people because we're in this kind of project management world, right? And project management is our perfect playground for doing this because we're all doing projects where it's start, middle, end, done. And then we look at, well, what's the next thing? Let's do something different and interesting next. We've got the opportunity to be able to do that, which is quite nice. And um, now we do here, uh, and project management has got a lot of transferable skills. It means you can jump, use those in different things. It's not as easy to jump as some people may, may think. I did a Prince 2 course years ago when, when, that, was, when that was quite, uh, I remember that back in the 90s, I think that was. And, and I do remember the trainer sort of trying to convince us that, that once you got Prince 2, you could project manage anything. And I know if anyone has tried to move from maybe IT project management into construction or things like that, well, no, actually, maybe that's not entirely true. Um, but, and it is a little bit more challenging than that. You can't just rock up with your certificate. However, what is true is that there are an awful lot of transferable skills in project management that you can use in a lot of different things. I found this when we had our when we've had our children, um, but, <laughs> all, but all, also you have this natural end point that comes up quite regularly when a project finishes. That kind of almost forces you to go take stock. What next? Which is quite nice. So we we've got that kind of luxury that sort of comes with things. I think which is quite nice in this world. Now. I've spoken quite a bit about this meandering around and leaping around and how redundancy has shaped things and we stop a project and we get to take it. And it all sounds like I might almost be standing here saying, yeah, well, go with the flow and see what happens. Mm, yeah. Huh? Mm. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> let's just, let's just change, change a little bit and let's just get into things. So having understood what we're talking about with this adaptive career and understanding what project management success in our project management careers looks and feels like let's now look at sort of what skills and things that we want to take on board for that. so hello joined late i'm john nice to meet you um do chip in and interrupt at any point because we're a small friendly group there's a few people online they're all lovely and you'll hear disembodied voices appear from now and again it is people on the call it's not a weird apparitions or anything um, um right okay so this is what i guess i really want to talk about is these these five things that you can do to really embrace this adaptive career of yours okay number one identify your strengths number two Continuously learn. Remember, I said sort of formal learning at the beginning. Learning carries on throughout. Um, building a strong professional network. Congratulations, you're already in that because you're here today. So well done. I'm here virtually and in the room. Um, embrace diverse experience and opportunities. I'll give you a couple of examples on that. And cultivating resilience and adaptability. We're going to use an American word for that. We're going to call it grit. <laughs> I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Okay, let's dive in. Right, what movie is this? Taken. Liam. Taken, yeah, Liam, Taken, absolutely perfect. You guys are on fire tonight. You know you're a popular culture, I'm impressed. And I'm sure you've got somebody mentioning that in the, if they're fast enough online typing that one or whether they're beaten to it by people in the room. Okay, what we're talking about here is understanding what your strengths are. If you're going to have this career that plays to your strengths, you need to understand what your strengths are. Right, let's start with the basic stuff. Um, understand what makes you good. Understand what your natural talents are. Now, it's really hard to do this, right? You get a blank bit of paper and go, what are the things that I'm awesome at? And 10 minutes later, I'm probably still sitting there with a blank piece of paper. Well, I'm all right, I guess. I'm not shy of standing up and talking. I can write that one down. But after that, I'm really, really struggling. It's hard. I don't know why it's hard, but it is hard. It is really hard to write down and identify your strengths. But think about a friend of yours. How easy would it be to tell you what their strengths are? You know what your friends' strengths are. You know what the people in your teams at work's strengths are. It's often hard to do your own. So have a think about your strengths and what they might be. If you're struggling with trying to write those down yourself, ask the people around you what your strengths are because they will tell you because they are often very, very helpful like that. And by the way, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about skills here, I'm not talking about the certifications and things that you've done, although you can measure things that way. Um, and you've got that BCS, um, IT project manager... Like, those things are important. That's not really well, a couple of nods. That, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your ability to, are you a leader? Who sees themselves as a leader? 
Hmm. Very, very confident leader. Lead, leaders in the room. Leaders in the room. And I'm really sure, based on our conversation earlier, it wasn't all the white men that put their hands up. So that's that's good. Again, <laughs> we're seeing diverse leadership, which is sorry, I'll lead back to a conversation earlier. Um, we've um, who's 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 a good. Um, I, who, who, who's good at sort of, I don't know, um, make, making peace if people are all, uh, arguing? Who's good at that sort of thing? Uh, a, few, a few peacemakers in the room. Who sees themselves as, um, as inspirational? Inspirational people. Who sees themselves as a really safe pair of hands? <laughs> it's just everything. Yeah, let's keep it. Up. <laughs> I am the complete package. I was just cautious. Cautious. Cautious, yeah. Who is very, very detail focused? Okay, I'm finally not seeing a hand up over here. And it's interesting, right? Because some of these you've heard are opposites, right? And that's another way to think about your strengths. So whilst we've sort of said, like, have a think about your strengths or natural talents. If you're finding it hard to think about those about yourself, ask the people around you, ask your partner, ask your friends, ask the people you work with, what are the things that make me good? You like working with me? Why? What are my strengths? I've been t I was challenged last night to write down strengths about myself and my mind's gone blank. Can you just help me out? Give me a couple to start me off. Ask people and they will willingly, willingly tell you what your strengths are. The third one to try and get these figured out is think about opposites. It is really easy to write down things that you're not very good at. Yeah. We've struggled writing down the good things. <laughs> if we write, think about what I'm not very good at. It's very easy to come up with a list. Again, I don't know why, but it's true. It, I can fill that piece of paper a lot easier than the other one, right? So think about those, but then flip them. What's the reverse side of that? I am rubbish at detail stuff. Does that mean I might be good at the shaping high level, big picture things? Because often you'll find if you're not one, the other, the opposite of that may well be a strength for you as well. So three ways of trying to have a think about what those strengths look like. Another way of doing it, online strength finder, strength finder test. There are loads of these around. Some of them you pay money for, some of them don't. I found this one online. I have no affiliation to it whatsoever, but it was the only, it was the first free one that I found because um, I'm not saying you something to pay for. But have a play around with these things if you want ideas as well. They all work in the same way. They will ask you a whole load of quest, pseudo psychometric questions about yourself, and they'll come back to you and say, well, this is what we think your strengths are based on this. You can look at those and think about, does that make sense? Does that feel like me? Great. It's giving you those ideas of what your strengths are. If it doesn't resonate, then it probably was a fairly rubbish test, right? But it's different ways of understanding what your skills are and what you are good at. Now, why, why, why should you bother putting all this stuff down on paper or figuring this stuff out? And the answer is at the bottom there, in the small writing at the bottom. So sorry to those at the back who are squinting a bit. You will be happiest in a role where 80% of your time is, or more than 80%, is spent on tasks that align with your strengths. Really, really simple example. If I am this shape, uh, if I'm this shaper person who likes big, broad strokes, inspirational things, follow me direction people, and I am suddenly finding myself in a PMO role where actually what they really, really need is me to spend a lot of time in the weeds of a spreadsheet focusing on the detail of data, I am not going to be doing my best work in that environment. Yeah. I'm not going to be passionate about it. I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm not going to get up and want to go to work. It's not me. Yeah, you will be happiest when you spend time on the work that aligns with your strengths. So step one, I'll, I'll come to you in just a second. Okay, so th come, think about what your strengths are. Get those down. Now, when you've got those down, do something with it. If you are an employee in a company, next time you go with to your line manager for a one to one and it kind of is that normal conversation of how's it going? All right. All right, have you taken all your holiday yet? You need to use it or lose it, yeah? All right, you need to be in the office a little bit more, yeah, because we've not seen you for a few days. You need to do that. Um, how's things going? Green? Okay, great. And then you wander off again, right? What if you came to that with a list of strengths? You're going, actually, I did something the other night because I went to a talk, um, and thank you for paying for my BCS subscription for another year, but I've actually got some value out of it. I did this whole thing about strengths, and it got me thinking. One of my big strengths is that I really, really love playing with Excel. I mentioned Excel, I'll stick with that as an example. I love playing with it. I really enjoy playing with it. I love complicated formulas. I think I can really make a world of difference. And actually, Excel has moved on to being sort of all this um, BI intelligence stuff now. And I think I could do a lot with that. 
my job at the moment, I don't do much of that stuff, but I really think it could be helpful for us. Is that something that I could squeeze in? Maybe if I could just carve out a little bit of time to do that, would you mind me doing that as a side project? And could we build on that? Yeah? What you know, I'm not, I'm not telling you, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying because of this line at the bottom, you should all get up tomorrow and leave your job and do something different, yeah? What I am saying is have a look at what your strengths are. And if you're not utilized, if the role that you're doing now, if 80% of that is not tasks that align with your strengths, think about how you can bring more of your strengths into the role that you're doing. Because you'll find you'll enjoy it more. And if you're enjoying it more, you're happier in your role. If you're happy in your role, you can be more productive and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All good with strengths. Yes, sir. Can I share a story with you? Oh, no, you, she's first story. Oh, okay, yes, go for it. Yes, um, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I just wanted to um, add to it that it all depends on what stage you are in your journey. Yes. Because you could have an opportunity to build on a strength. Yes. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Not right. saying that this is my strength and this is it. It depends on what you're trying to achieve and what you're passionate about. Hold that thought. I think I come to it a little bit. You're absolutely right, though. Yes, your strengths will change, and there are opportunities to learn new ones that may not be immediately obvious. Well, absolutely right. Sorry, sorry. Your story. Can I share a story? Of course, you can share. You you know you know us by now. We're a friendly bunch. Everyone online. <laughs> the moment you started talking, then everyone online recognised your voice. They've all sat forward. They're leaning in. <laughs> Okay, they're a bit nervous about that. They've got their credit cards out for the next Amazon. Yeah, originally, from, <laughs> originally from Egypt, so when I was young, you know, Ramadan is a very important month. Mm -hmm. And for kids, they were showing a TV series, 30 days. Each day, they are talking about a positive virtue, like generosity, mm -hmm. uh, braveness, determination. I don't remember any of these episodes, but I remember the last episode. And the last episode was about a very wise man uh, that the king asked him to summarize all his wisdom in a book so hmm. that if he pass away, they have his wisdom. And when the wise man passed away, they searched for this book. They found a very, very big book. The first page is blank page. The second is blank. All the pages is blank. And the, the king got really, really angry. He found one page and he opens this one page and he was talking about determination when it's too much, it is stubbornness. When braveness is so much, it's stupidness or whatever. And he said the most important strength or virtue a man, a woman should have is balance. And that's why when I remember this story, when I get advice from respectful people like you and telling me turn the, the weakness to strength, the strength to whatever, I still think even though it's not really a game, any things that we have, if we don't balance it, it becomes weakness and, yeah. and, and vice versa. And I saw this in projects as well. I can see things before it happened or I claim to be, and I try to push people to go into the right direction. And they may do what I ask them to do, but by mm. the end, they are not happy. And overall, the project is not successful. Mm. And when I learn just to adapt on everyone what he can provide, and I don't push, push much, mm. I have more success. So that was even a clear example for me, pushing so much, seeing the right direction so much. It's, it's all about really balance, and when you bring certain strengths in the right time. Hmm. So, yeah. I, I hope you enjoy the story. No, no, I like that. And absolutely. Childhood. Yes. <laughs> yes, as, as, as project managers, you need to be, um, I, 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 when I do training, I sort, of I, I, I sort of create, sort of talk about these sort of five hats. I can't remember where, what model this is from now, but talk about people being, um, a, a project manager needs to be a leader. So that sort of inspirational direction setting, um, a manager, a person who's defining the processes and measuring the KPIs, um, a coach, bringing the best out in people, um, a mentor, I've been here before, this is what we need to do, and a trainer as well, teaching people what they need to do. And the project management, it, those those are all hats you're wearing at a different time. But when I go through this, I tend to say, well, actually, you, when you look at those on a page and the definitions of them, you naturally find that actually, I'm probably more one of those than the other. I'm that, that one, there's me. Or maybe two of those are me and not so much the other ones. If you look at that and understand that about yourself, 
as a project manager, you need to be balanced because you need all those hats, right? So you're looking at, well, are those the ones that I naturally lean towards? So you then start thinking about, well, if actually, what do I need to do to force myself out of those zones and into the other ones at the right times for us? Because if we have this, this, everyone wants to be a leader. Right? Um, the problem with someone who's purely in that leader space is they have a whole load of ideas and inspirational stuff but very, very little about the detail of how you get them off. I used to have a manager like this. He was a lovely guy, right? He came in in the morning. He had a long train journey in, and he had to stand up so he couldn't get his computer out. So he'd have all these ideas in his head, and he wouldn't be able to write them down. He'd suddenly come into the office and sort of explode these ideas out of what we were. I've got these great ideas of what we can do next, what we can and, and it was always an action on me to kind of get this stuff delivered. And what I found in the end was I had a post-it note wall. And as he's going, got this idea, I'm going, great, great, great. And I sort of write this idea that he had down. And go, okay, so where does it, I, lo I love it, I love it. Where does it go? Which, how high on the list is this? Which things am I putting this above? And then I'm doing the management hat bit because he was always in that leadership hat thing and never, never got into the management thing. So you need to strike that balance. And if you can't do it in yourself, think about how you get that balance in the teams around you as well. Complementary skills. Yeah, I like that. Um, where was I? Where was I? I was, ah, yes, I was, we were with Liam, weren't we? We were with Liam. So your strengths, your strengths, think about your strengths and different ways that you can figure those out because if you can align your role with your strengths, then you're going to be a far better person in life, outside of work and in life and in your role because you'll be more productive. Right, second thing, continuous learning and skill development. Right, we know now, because I've hinted at it several times, that it's not about learning at the beginning and then stopping or doing your BCSIT project manager certification and then stopping, yeah? We need to be learning continuously. We found that, I mean, when I started out, um, when I was young, um, when I learned about computers, it was through a magazine that I ordered and arrived at the newsagent every week. It was called Input Magazine. It had a cassette on the front, but you put programs into your computer by reading the code and typing it in. That was how we programmed things on my computer that had a whole 5K of memory, my VIC-20, Commodore VIC-20. Lovely machine. If I had just learned about computers then and stopped, I would be very, very lost right now. Whereas at the moment, I am working with, I do have chat GPT on the side of, 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 of my, my desktop a lot of the time, and I absolutely agree with what you're saying about it. I do a lot of work with robotic process automation, um, which we use to automate a lot of tasks for some of my clients as well. Um, and you've got to keep evolving and learning continuously. A few ways to make this happen. Block time out. If you don't block time, it isn't going to happen. You'll still be talking about <laughs> learning something at some point. Lock time out for learning. Set yourself goals. What do you want to do and why do you want to do it is another important one. These are really basic things. These are quite simple and yet we don't always do them. Study broadly is another really, really important one. It's quite tempting as project managers to study project management. Go wide on that as often as you can. Because project management is so broad, we're pulling in so many different management skills and strengths in our career, you can afford to go really wide. And when you look, there's lessons everywhere. One of the fa my, my favorite books recently um, was, apologies again for the, for the credit cards people, but, um, but um, a book called <laughs> Never, Never Split the Difference. I forget the guy's name, but you should be able to Google it. He was a hostage negotiator. And he's talking about negotiation skills. Really, really brings his history to life, but also gives some really, really good advice about negotiating, having those difficult conflicts, high pressure conversations, and trying to bring them to very, very successful resolutions. Fantastic. I read a book about um, a book for, um, for IT architects. I have to admit, there were whole sections of it I did not understand a word of. But I read it because I was very interested. I had this sort of thing where I was like, I can see the PMO, enterprise PMO, shaping how we deliver projects and how agile teams and how value streams are shaped in organizations. And I also see increasingly an enterprise architect's role as looking at those value streams and everything as well. And maybe there's some synergy there and maybe we should be working a lot closer together. So I read a book to learn about their world, to understand it. There's all these different areas you can learn from. Has anyone played with Coursera? Coursera, online, online learning platform. Oh, a nod for a couple of nods. I've got a Coursera subscription and I love it. Um, I must confess, I have never finished a Coursera course. Not one. 
what I tend to use it for is I'll need to learn about something and I'll dive in at a weekend. I'll probably immerse myself for a couple of hours in something or four or five hours. I'll, I'll cram the subject. It's like, all right, I'll get my head around that now. Enough to be able to do the next thing that I'm interested in. And then I'll forget about it and I won't actually finish off the course. Uh, so I suddenly got a passion for astronomy for a little bit and I sort of deep dived into that, then got bored, then did something else. And, and that's just kind of how I naturally do things, right? But I'm learning and bringing ideas in and knitting them together. Um, don't feel you always have to complete the certification. Don't feel you always have to finish the book. Don't always feel you, don't, you need to finish something through to completion. The point is you're always learning. The outcome is the learning, not necessarily the certificate, okay? Yes, sir, very quickly. I really like this, but I want to add the fact that you just learn from certain things, but there is also a website called Harvard X, yeah. and it also gives outstanding uh, courses for free. Harvard X as well, there we go. And on the 13th of March, the day of Pi, 3.14, you offer even more free courses on that day. Perfect. There we go. Look, see, we're not just getting you to buy books. You get free. You get, you get, you get free websites for learning as well. So do learn and do study broadly because it will make you better, richer people. And when we talk about those careers, adapting and career and swiggling, the wider your knowledge, the broader your mindset, the different conversations you can have with different people will help you with that. Um, the other thing that helps you is number three, a strong professional network. Now, we need to be careful because we're talking about networking, right? Um, this is a meetup thing that I run uh, once a month. The next one's on Friday um, called um, PMO Hot House. If you're a PMO person, this will be good fun. If you're not a PMO person, it's probably not for you because we talk a lot about PMOs, as, you would, as, as, it would, as the name would suggest. Now, when we talk about networking, there are the extroverts that think, great, let's go out and do a big social event thing. And there are those that imagine networking as being like those, those sort of speed dating, speed networking events where you go and meet somebody who's very important. They give you a business card. You have a three-minute conversation, buzz, and then you move on to the next one. And you try and build those connections, yeah? That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about rocking up to very, very large conferences and expecting to handshake everybody and getting a big LinkedIn network of 35,000 people. This is really talking about your small, close, intimate networks, the people that you have around you. That is your valuable network. Yes, those connections are useful, but it's this bit that I really want to sort of focus on now, okay? And this networking is not just for extroverts. This is every bit as important for introverts to do as well, okay? So firstly, quality, more important than quantity. It's not about how big your social reach is on Insta. It's about whether you have the right people around you to support you. And that bullet below that has got the key things in there. You want people who can support you, challenge you, and empathize with you, okay? Three quite different things, uh, just a second in these. So the people who will support you, if you are doing something and you're like, oh, I really, I'm studying business, I'm really not sure I'm doing this right, am I, am, I'm, maybe, maybe, maybe this was a really, really bad idea. They're the ones that are saying, well, no, I, I think this is great, and actually maybe I can connect with somebody, I think you're doing the right thing, stick with it. That kind of person is really, really powerful. Then I've got my friend Joanna, who's started a few businesses herself and written a book on, on, on selling your successful business as an entrepreneur before you move on to your next one. Um, and I go and have a quick chat with her about stuff. And she said, oh, how's our PMO guy? I said, oh, that's all right. Yeah, we've kind of grown this. We've got a new client here. She said, right, so what's your revenue goal for this year? Why aren't you pushing yourself more? Why have you only limited yourself to being in two different countries? Why aren't you in five? <laughs> She's in that challenging space. She challenges me. She does not let me get comfortable. She'll push, push, push. Um, and then the people that empathize with you. Sometimes you don't want somebody to fix things in terms of supportive, let me net, connect with people or challenge you. Sometimes you just want someone who can just listen and go, yeah, I, I understand. Not offer advice, just be that sort of shoulder to cry on or someone to lean on. You need to surround yourself with those people. And if you haven't got those people, think about what you, where those gaps are, who you might want to bring in closer. Because that is your real, real, real important network. Okay? <laughs> Anyone can click connect on LinkedIn a lot of times a day. But if you have those powerful, if you have that group around you, that is the stuff that builds you up and energizes you and takes you forward. Okay? And that is just as important for introverts as well. Now, when you are networking with new people, I would say it's important to make sure you bring something to the table. Okay? Networking is not a one way thing. I've been to meetups where people sort of come up to you and say, oh, yeah, I'm here um, to, to, I'm here at this networking event to, to network.
network and can I connect to you because I know you've got a, a project a, a PMO company and I think it'd be good to connect I was like well okay but I'm happy to connect um, I'm not quite sure what that means but yeah let's let's do that and we, we we tap LinkedIn things and that's it but a different way of doing that if we just stick with LinkedIn for a moment right reaching out to somebody on LinkedIn and sort of saying hi um, I'm in the PMO space I noticed you're in the PMO space um, I really I did I went to that BCS thing you did I really love the talk it resonated with me um, and I just thought it'd be good to connect up I don't have an immediate question for you but I'd like to stay in touch then maybe a week later saying actually me again I saw an article on AI stuff in the project management space and you mentioned AI in your talk and I thought you might find it useful hmm. it's low effort for you just seen an article and thought I might like it but from my side, you're bringing something to my network. Networking is a two-way thing. So when you're making those connections, think what you bring to the table as much as what you can get out of it. Because quite often people think about it one way. So do try and make that two-way because you'll build a lot more valuable relationships and more genuine relationships than just having connections that you can tick a box on. Fourth one on there, embracing diverse experiences and opportunities. Luck, luck, luck is very, very important. It's been very good for my career. There's probably um, a big point of luck for me. Um, I did um, I did an MBA um, and it was quite weird because I didn't do a first degree. I came out of school and worked in McDonald's and I spent eight years with McDonald's and I went from mopping floors and doing kids parties and ended up running a couple of their restaurants in Reading, um, which I very much enjoyed doing. They were, they were big, high volume. I think Reading was the, the tenth biggest in the UK at the time, um, which was which was great. But then I, I, don't know, I just suddenly had an epiphany and decided I wanted to do something different, and did. Um, but I always felt I was a bit of an imposter. I was running. I ended up in project management. I was running projects for companies, and I was going in and saying, "Right, this is how we're doing this project." And I felt like I was an imposter that I didn't really belong doing this because I was still the guy from McDonald's. Um, and I looked at doing a degree and taking three years out didn't really make much financial sense. I looked at MBAs. They were one year courses. That seemed to make a lot more financial sense. So I kind of explored that idea and I phoned a few places and ended up sort of, I ended up long story short, I went to Cranfield. But one of the things that Cranfield wanted was references. So I spoke to them and they said, right, you need to get a good GMAT entry score. I did that. I got a good score. They're like, okay, well, let's, let's talk about what you need in terms of references because you've not got a degree. You need references from somebody sort of about your commercial acumen, but also you need someone. Uh, do you know somebody who's got an MBA? I said, no. Those kind of circles. Do you know somebody with a PhD? I don't know Brian Cox. <laughs> but by luck, my manager at the time was a guy called Greg Coleman. And he, whilst he was running a team of project managers in an IT outsourcing company, because that's where his career had taken him, he also happened to have a PhD in chemistry. So that wasn't the path he chose to go down. But he had that. And I was then guided to get him to help me to write, to get him to write a reference for me. And his reference basically said, hi, I'm Greg. I have a PhD in chemistry. I know what it takes to work at that level. And based on what I know of John, I can vouch for the fact that he has got what it takes to do a master's degree at that level. I was very, very lucky hmm. that I happened to have a line manager in project management who had a PhD in chemistry. That was a large, large stroke of luck for me. Yeah? Luck does play a huge part in some of those lists you get. Even earlier than that, when I came out of, um, I, I was working after the McDonald's thing, I was working in IT support, first line, second line, third line, server support, Windows NT servers, um, turning things off and on again and putting floppy disks in, because it was floppy disks back then. Um, but I wanted to do project management. And I spoke to my manager about it and said I wanted to do it. And I ended up getting a, a, a sort of Prince 2 certification. But it was my manager who then said, well, actually, maybe we can get you as a comment into a project management team. Not all managers would do that. And I was very, very lucky that happened. If that hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't have ended up in project management. Things would have happened differently. So there is a lot of luck that happens. Yes, sir. I appreciate everything you have seen. And it's nice you defined the luck. Mm. And I, was in trying to, I was trying to say that there is nothing like luck. It mm. is what you work for, you build up. And the opportunity comes and becomes love. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. No, yeah, yes, there is, there is a lot. And combined with that, there is a few things. So there's the risk taking as well that comes with it. Yeah. yeah? So the um, gentleman here knows me from, used to, I used to work at Ticketmaster. I made the decision to leave Ticketmaster in 2019 to start my own business up. I'd wanted to do that for a while. I wasn't quite sure. I had a long chat with my wife. And everyone who gives you advice about leaving your permanent job and starting your own company up will tell you this. They will tell you, make sure you've got at least six months money in the bank. They will tell you that. If I had to get six months money in the bank, I would still be working at Ticketmaster. Probably for the rest of my life. Because kids are expensive. And social life's expensive. I'm never going to build up that money. It was minus money then. It's slightly well, about the same now, if I'm honest about it. But there we go. Um, so we went for it. I had a chat with my wife and said, well, I think I can make this work. What do you think? And she said, well, do you really think you can make it work? I said, yes. And she said, well, do it. So we took the risk. Um, it was risky. And yet I was lucky that I had a wife that would support me with that. So risk, luck, risk, luck. Both, both things are important. What I will say is sometimes luck does need a helping hand, though. And there's four things that I need you to think about with your careers here, OK? Firstly, when you're thinking about where your career is going, think about it with these four things in mind. What is your obvious career path? What's the obvious thing for you to do next? Most of you, when you think about career, you can think about what that looks like, yeah? I know what the next role is up for me. I'm going to do a bigger project, a more exciting project, something like that. Then think about your pivot. What if you do something entirely different? What does that look like? Leaving McDonald's and end up going to work in tech. That was quite a big pivot. Leaving my project management to do an MBA. Pivoty. What do those things look like? What's your ambitious goal? What's your absolute stretch? I want to be prime minister. I'm going to be king. A queen, whatever it might be, I don't know. What's that super ambitious vision that you have for yourself? And what's the dream one? What was that one that you did have in your head when you were a little kid? I want to be, I want to be a teacher. Um, what were those kind of things? Think about those things. Now, it may be now that none of those help you at all because it's the wrong time. But if you keep thinking about those opportunities and what those look like, you will see that luck more easily when it comes along. If you've got those four different paths, when you have conversations, you'll see things differently. You go, oh, if I grab that bit of learning, if I grab that idea, if I grab those opportunities to learn new skills that I didn't even know I needed earlier, so back to your point, you're going to take yourself in a different direction. And you don't always see those things unless you're thinking about your career in terms of the pivots you might take, the dreams you might have, the ambitious steps you might have. That's where you kind of see that luck a lot more and, and, and drive it. Yeah, I think building credibility yes. helps as well. So I say again? I think building credibility early on in your career helps as well to be lucky. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have, get, get, some, get some wins under your belt absolutely helps as well, very much so. Um, let's take you on to this one. Angela Duckworth, grit, grit. You can tell we're talking American here, right, already, because it's called grit. Um, okay, so, uh, so Angela Duckworth, um, she's got a great TED Talk. Uh, it's six minutes and 38 seconds of your time, well worth a listen to. Um, she used to be a management consultant and then went into teaching. Was that a pivot for her? Was it her dream thing? I have no idea. You would have to ask her on that one which way that was going for her. Um, she disappeared and came back on the screen over there. Um, but what she did, she took some of her management sort of consultancy skills into the classroom and she was looking at pupils and trying to predict who was going to do well. And it wasn't the ones that had the high IQ because school is also to kind of measure IQ, right? And it wasn't those ones that were successful. And she ended up, when she finished her teaching thing, she then went on to do a psychology degree and she did some studies around what she called grit. And grit was defined as perseverance and passion for long-term goals. If you're passionate about a long-term goal and you persevere with that, if that's what you do, then you are far more likely to be successful. So they found, she found that was a better, if they could do a test for grit, that was a better predictor of success than any other tests they were doing. Better than IQ, better than anything else that they were doing. That was a definite indicator of success for anything. So that was a study that they did. Persever perseverance and passion for long-term goals is a really, really important one for you. But, 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 what if you're sitting here going, it's 10 to 8, and I only came for the wine, and this guy's been talking for a bit, <laughs> and I feel I've been persevering for a while. <laughs> Passion failing. What if you're not a perseverance and passion first person? Hearing that actually you need grit is a bit worrying, right? Okay, there are some a few, there's a few. Where's my other slide gone? I've lost a slide. 
give me two seconds, I might have invisible the slide. We've deleted the slide, there's a slide gone. Oh no, there it is, we're back, we're back, we're back, nobody panic. Nobody panic. There we go. Resilience and grit. A few things, right? Again, so if you're not feeling this kind of perseverance and passion thing, bring it back to the things we've already talked about. Do things you enjoy. Do things that align to your skills. If you're doing things you enjoy, you will naturally put the passion, the resilience and grit stuff, the perseverance and passion comes naturally if you enjoy it. You don't have to work at having passion for something and persevering if it is something you enjoy doing, if it is something that aligns to your skills. So think about those things. Next thing, practice, uh, so th actually third thing, I'll come back to that one. Align your work with your values. What are your values? Not just your skills, but your values. Are you a religious person? Is your job aligned to your religious values? If not, maybe you want to look for something that aligns better with that. Um, embrace learning opportunities. Grab those, grab those, grab those whenever they come up. I'm a certified robotic process automation expert, bizarrely, because it looked interesting. It's not quite a PMO thing, but it looks interesting, so you grab it. And I've won a couple of big contracts for my company with companies like Pay by Phone because we happen to know that. And it got me out of a few holes in a couple of sticky situations with other clients, which I'll tell you about over a glass of wine. Um, so do embrace those learning opportunities because you never know where they might take you. And this other one here that, that plays along with this whole idea of grit. Practice to improve your skills. I've put two down there. Public speaking and dealing with conflict, because those are two that normally come up. And those are ones, no matter which different paths your career takes you on, no matter what meanders you might go on and side hustles you might come up with, these two come up time and time again. If you are not confident public speaking, this is one you need to persevere with practice. I don't mean stand up in a large group of people and people online, I know you can't see this, but there's literally about 10,000 people in the room here. <laughs> it takes a while to build up to this kind of level of confidence. Yeah, But start off with small groups, do lunch and learn sessions, speak to your, do a, do a little group thing where actually there's four of you in the office and you talk about your hobbies and learn more about each other. Little things like that. If you want to do more, uh, Toastmasters is a great organization where you get people together who may not be confident speakers, but you practice and you give each other feedback and you yeah. learn to give feedback and you learn to talk about things. Really, really good opportunities. But do learn to speak. Your goal may not be to Brian May on top of the Buckingham Palace level of, level of um, sort of publicness, <laughs> but small steps will make you better and will allow you to embrace this wiggly career of yours. Um, conflict is another really important one. Nobody likes conflict. Nobody goes out to start an argument, unless you're John Cleese in that little sketch that he did in for Monty Python a long time ago. Um, dealing with conflict is hard, but it is a skill that you can learn. I mentioned a book earlier, there's a few books on dealing with conflict and how to handle that and how to have the right conversations around it. If this is something that you feel holds you back, if you feel you shy away from those conversations because you don't want an argument, Possibly that's one of your strengths is that you're a team player and you resolve conflict. Equally, it could be that you're avoiding those difficult things. Learn it, practice it, because those two skills are really, really important ones to help you persevere. Okay? A few things about the grit stuff there. <sighs> that is kind of the key things that I wanted to go through. So just to recap a few things there, because we've talked a lot. I've, I've talked a lot. I've had a lot of stories in the back of the room. Our online team, thank you ever so much for interjecting. I have valued your input. I haven't forgotten that you're there. Are you over there on the camera? Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, crucially, the key things I want you to take away, right, is congratulations that because you're in the project management space, you are really, really, really well placed for this adaptive career in a way that a lot of other people and a lot of other pro professions probably aren't. So well done for that. And you'll see it with your pure IT colleagues in other areas of BCS. They might get stuck where they learn a particular software language and they suddenly find actually that one falls out of favor and they've not learned a new one. You don't have that challenge as project managers. Your skills are far more transferable, maybe, um, <laughs> over wine. So well done for that. You've got opportunities there, okay, which is great. You've got those natural opportunities you can build on. Um, we are going to have these career paths where we recognize we're not going to be in a straight line. We are going to meander, meander around. We want to build up skills, therefore, that allow us to pivot, allow us to follow our dreams, allow us to go in different directions when the time comes, whether that's 
the time coming because we want to change or whether it's because AI has happened or family emergencies have happened. We want to have that flexibility. These are the five areas that we're focusing on to allow ourselves to build that flexibility. This idea of identifying your strengths, knowing what they are, so you can seek out the opportunities to utilize them, learning all the time, learn everything, building that strong network, which we will do shortly over a drink, I, I, I think. Um, embrace diverse experiences and opportunities, because you never know what random thing may happen next that might lead you to that next step. And that resilience thing. Grit, perseverance and things. And if you're not naturally persevering at things, learn things like conflict resolution, public speaking, and find roles that you enjoy because you'll find perseverance far more easy if you're doing something that you enjoy in alliance with your strengths. And that was me in a nutshell. I hope you've learned a lot about me and I've given you a bit of food for thought in terms of career stuff. Were there any final questions before we... <laughs>